For myself, I meditated in silence on this accumulation of contrarieties which struck with to double blows in so short a time. It was a precious moment for an observer. I estimated the torments they were calculated to produce, and I remarked with admiration the few he suffered to escape. I said to myself, this is the intractable man. This is the tyrant. It might have been said that he knew what was passing my mind for when we left the calash and were a few paces before the others, he said to me in a low tone, if you'd like to study mankind, learn how far patience can go and all that one can put up with. On his return, he called for tea. I had never seen him take any. Madame de Montelon was, for the first time, in possession of her new saloon. He wished to see it. I observed that she would be much better accommodated. Then is all. He called for fire and played at chess with several of us successively. He gradually resumed his natural state and ate a little at dinner, which completely restored him. He indulged in conversation and again reverted to his early years, which always possessed fresh charms for him. He spoke a great deal of his early acquaintances and of the difficulties some of them had in obtaining admission to him after his elevation, and observed that if the threshold of his palace was impassable, it was in spite of himself. What then, said he, must be the situation of other sovereigns in that respect. We continued the conversation until eleven without noticing the lateness of the hour, the 24th. Today, the emperor tried the billiard table, which had been just laid down and went out, but the weather being very damp, he returned almost immediately. He conversed with me in his apartment, but for dinner on the emigrants, and the name of Madame de B, who had been Dame de Tour to Madame, and was very conspicuous in the commencement of our affairs, was mentioned the emperor observed. But it is not this Madame de B, a dangerous woman. Certainly not, I replied. She is, on the contrary, one of the best women in the world, with a great deal of wit and an excellent judgment. If this is the case of the error, she must have much cause to complain of me. This is the painful consequence of false representations. He was pointed out as a very dangerous character. Yes, sire, you made her very unhappy. Madame de B placed all her happiness in the charms of society, and you banished her from Paris. I met with her in one of my missions, confirmed within her province, and pining away with vexation, yet she expressed no resentment against your majesty and spoke of you with great moderation. Well, then, why did you not come to me and set me right? I say your character was then so little known to us compared with what I know it to be at present that I should not have dared to take it upon myself. But I will mention an anecdote of Madame de B. When at London, during the high tide of our emigration, which will make you better acquainted with her than anything I could say. At the time when you were declared consul, a person just arrived from Paris was invited to a small party at her house. He engrossed the attention of the company in consequence of all the particulars. He had to communicate respecting a place which interested us so materially. He was asked several questions respecting the consul. He could not say he lived long. He is so yellow as to inspire delight. These were his words. He grew more animated by degrees and gave us a toast. To the death of the first consul. Oh, horrible was the instantaneous exclamation of Madame de B. What? To drink to the death of a human being for shame? I will give a much better one to the king's house. Well, said the emperor, I repeat that she was very ill used by me in consequence of the representations which were made to me. She had been described to me as a person fond of political intrigues and remarkable for the bitterness of her sarcasm and this puts me in mind of an expression which is perhaps wrongly attributed to her but which struck me however solely on account of its wit i was assured that a distinguished personage who was very much attached to her was seized with a fit of jealousy for which she clearly proved she had given no cause he persisted however and observed that she ought to know that the wife of caesar should be free from suspicion madame de b replied that the remark contained two important mistakes for it was known to all the world that she was not his wife and that he was not Caesar. After dinner, the emperor read us parts of the comedies of the Dissipator and the Gloria. 
But he was so little pleased with them that he left off. They did not possess a sufficient degree of interest. He suffered severely in his right side. It was the effect of the dampness with which he had been affected during his morning walk. And we were not without apprehensions of its being a symptom of the common malady of these scorching climates. On my return home, I found a letter from England with a parcel containing some articles for my toilet. The Griffin ship of war had just arrived from England the 25th. About 9 o'clock, I received from the Grand Marshal three letters for the Emperor. They were from Madame Mare, the Princess Pauline, and Prince Lucien. The latter was enclosed in one addressed to me from Rome by Prince Lucien, dated the 6th of March. I also received two from my agent in London. The Emperor passed the whole of the morning in reading the papers from the 25th of April to the 13th of May. They contained accounts of the death of the Empress of Austria, of the prorogation of the French chambers of Cambron's acquittal, and the sentence passed upon General Bertrand. He made many remarks upon these subjects. About three, Admiral Malcolm requested to be presented to the emperor. He brought him a series of journal de debat to the 13th of May. The emperor desired me to introduce him, and he conversed with him nearly three hours. He gave great pleasure to the emperor, who treated him from the first moment with a great deal of freedom and good nature, as if he had been an old acquaintance. The admiral was entirely of his opinion with respect to a great number of subjects. He admitted that it was extremely difficult to escape from St. Helena, and he could see no inconvenience in allowing him to be at large in the island. He considered it absurd that Plantation House had not been given up to the emperor and felt, but only since his arrival, he confessed that the title of general might be offensive. It struck him that Lady Loudon's conduct had been ridiculous here and would be laughed at in London. He thought that the governor had good intentions but did not know how to act. Ministers had, in his opinion, been embarrassed with respect to the emperor, but entertained no hatred against him. They did not know how to dispose of him. Had he remained in England, he would have been and was still a terror to the continent. He would have been too dangerous and efficient an instrument in the hands of the opposition. He was apprehensive, however, that all these circumstances put together would detain us here a long time, and he expressed his confidence that it was the intention of ministers, with the exception of the necessary precautions to prevent his escape, that Napoleon should be treated with every possible indulgence at St. Helena. He delivered himself upon all these points in so satisfactory a manner that the emperor discussed the business with him with as little warmth as if it was perfectly indifferent to him. At one moment, the emperor produced a sensible effect upon him. It was when alluding to the commissioners, he pointed out the impossibility of receiving them. After all, sir, said he, you and I are men. I appeal to you. Is it possible that the Emperor of Austria, whose daughter I married, who implored that union on his knees, who retained my wife and my son, should send me his commissioner without a line for myself, without the smallest scrap of a bulletin with respect to my son's health? Can I receive him with consistency? Can I have anything to communicate to him? I may say the same thing of the commissioner sent by Alexander, who gloried in calling himself my friend with whom, indeed, I carried on political wars, but had no personal quarrel. It is a fine thing to be a sovereign, but we are not on that account the less entitled to be treated as men. I lay claim to no other character at present. Can they all be destitute of feeling? Be assured, sir, that when I object to the title of general, I am not offended. I decline it merely because it would be an acknowledgment that I have not been emperor. And in this respect, I advocate the honor of others more than my own. I advocate the honor of those with whom I have been in that rank connected by treaties, by family, and political alliances. The only one of these commissioners whom I might perhaps receive would be that of Louis XVIII, who owes me nothing. That commissioner was a long time my subject. He acts merely in conformity to circumstances independent of his opinion, and I should accordingly receive him tomorrow. Why not apprehensive of the misrepresentations that would take place and of the false coloring that would be given to the circumstance? After dinner, the emperor again alluded to the time of his consulate, to the numerous conspiracies which had been formed against him, to the celebrated persons of that period. I have already noticed these topics at considerable length. The conversation lasted until one o'clock in the morning, a very extraordinary hour for us. 
26th to the 28th, our usual mode of living and airing in the carriage in the middle of the day, conversation at night. On the 27th, the emperor received for a moment a colonel, a relation to the family of Walsh Surin, who was on his return from the Cape in the Haycomb and was to sail next day for Europe. He had the governor of Bourbon and entertained us with many agreeable particulars respecting that island. After dinner, the conversation turned on the old and new court with their arrangements, expenses, etiquette. I have already mentioned most of these points in another place, and many of them were repeated on the present occasion. I pass over what would seem but literal repetition. The emperor's court was, in every relation, much more magnificent than anything seen up to that period, and yet, said he, the expense was infinitely less. The vast difference was caused by the suppression of abuses and by the introduction of order and regularity into the accounts, his hunting and shooting establishment, with the exception of some useless and ridiculous particulars he observed." as that of falconry and some others was as splendid as numerous and as striking as that of louis the sixteenth and the annual disbursement he assured us was but four hundred thousand francs while the king amounted to seven millions his table was regulated according to the same system de Rock had by his regularity and strictness done wonders in that respect under the kings the palaces did not continue furnished and the same articles were transferred from one palace to another the people belonging to the court had no furniture allowed them and every one was obliged to look out for himself under him on the contrary there was not a person in attendance who did not find himself provided as comfortably even more so with everything that was necessary and suitable in the apartment assigned to him then in his own house the emperor's muse cost three millions the expense of the horses was averaged at three thousand francs a horse yearly a page cost from six to eight thousand francs that establishment he observed was perhaps the most expensive belonging to the palace and accordingly the education of the pages and the care taken of them were the subject of just encomium the first families of the empire was solicitous to place their children on it and the inducements were irresistible with respect to the etiquette of the court the emperor said he was the first who had separated the service of honor and experience expression invented under him from that which was absolutely necessary he had dismissed everything that was laborious and substantial and substituted what was nominal and ornamental only a king he said is not to be found in nature he is the mere creation of civilization there are no naked kings they must all be dressed the emperor remarked that it was impossible for anyone to be better informed of the nature and relation of all these matters than himself because they had been all regulated by him according to the precedents of past times from which he had lopped off whatever was ridiculous and preserved everything that seemed suitable the conversation lasted until after eleven o'clock it had been kept up with tolerable spirit and the emperor again observed on leaving us that after all we must be a good-natured kind of people to be able to lead so contented a life at saint helena the 29th the weather had been bad for some days the emperor took advantage of a fine moment to examine a tent which the admiral had in a very handsome manner ordered to be raised for his accommodation by the ship's crew having heard him complain in the course of conversation of the want of shade and of the impossibility of enjoying himself in the air out of his apartment the emperor conversed with the officer and men who were putting the last hand to the work and ordered a Napoleon to be given to each of the seamen. We learned today that the last vessel had brought a book on the state of public affairs for the emperor written, as it was said, by a member of parliament. It had been sent by the author himself, and the following words were inscribed in letters of gold on the outside to Napoleon the Great. This circumstance induced the governor to retain the work. A rigor on his part which formed a singular contrast with his eagerness to supply us with libels that spoke so disrespectfully of the emperor. During dinner, the emperor turning with a stern look to one of the servants in waiting exclaimed to our utter consternation, So then, assassin, you resolved to kill the governor, wretch! If such a thought ever again enters your head, you will have to do with me. You will see how I shall behave to you. Gentlemen, it is Santini there who determined to kill the emperor, <laughs> the governor. That rascal was about to involve us in a sad embarrassment. I find it necessary to exert all my authority, all my indignation to restrain him. With 
the view of explaining this extraordinary transaction, it is necessary for me to observe that Santini, who was formerly usher of the emperor's cabinet, and whose extreme devotion had prompted him to follow his master and serve him, no matter, he said, in what capacity, he was a Corsican of deep feeling and a warm imagination, enraged at the governor's bad usage, no longer able to bear with patience the affronts he saw heaped upon the emperor, exasperated at the decline of his health and affected his himself with a distracting melancholy he had for some time done no work in the house and under pretense of procuring some game for the emperor's table his employment seemed to be that of shooting in the neighborhood in a moment of confidence he told his countryman Cipriani that he had formed the project by the means of his double-barreled piece of killing the governor and then putting an end to himself and all that said he to rid the world of a monster. Cipriani, who knew his countryman's character, was shocked at his determination and communicated it to several other servants. They all united in entreating him to lay aside his design, but their efforts, instead of mitigating, seemed to but inflame his irritation. They resolved then to discover the project to the emperor who had him instantly brought before him, and it was only, he told me sometimes afterwards, by imperial, by pontifical authority, that he finally succeeded in making the scoundrel desist altogether from his project. Observe for a moment the fatal consequence. He was about to produce, I should have also passed, for the murderer, the assassin of the governor, in reality. It would have been very difficult to destroy such an impression in the mind of a great number of people. The emperor read to us La Morte de Pompeii, which was stated in the journals to be the subject of general interest in Paris on account of its political illusions. And this gave rise to the remark that government had been obliged to forbid the representation of Richard, and that certainly on the 5th and 6th of October, Louis the Sixteenth, little thought of it ever being prohibited for its allusions to another. The fact is, the times are wonderfully changed, said the emperor, the 30th, the emperor, after a few turns in the garden, went to General Gorgo's apartment, where he was a long time employed with his compass and crayon in ascertaining the dimensions of the coast of Syria and the plan of St. Jean d'Acre, which the general was to execute in marking some points about St. Jean d'Acre. He said, I passed many unpleasant moments there. In the evening, we had Le Mariage de Figaro, which entertained and interested us much more than we had been led to expect. It was, observed the emperor, in shedding the book, the revolution already put into action. The 31st, the weather was horrible, and the emperor found great difficulty in going to Madame de Montrand's saloon. He amused himself for some time in reading the Thousand and One Nights and afterwards perceiving a volume of the Monitor on which Monsieur de Montalon was then employed and which lay open in the part relative to the negotiations for a maritime armistice in 1800. His whole attention was absorbed by them before upwards.